Okay, so for today's work, um, we're not always going to start over every time that we come in, but the first few times we will. We'll start a, a new project the first few times to uh, get us used to the routine, and then we will continue uh, following days. So the first thing you want to do is let's create a folder on your flash drive or the desktop. So on the desktop, I'll create a new folder here new folder. We'll put today's date and in the folder <clears throat> is where we're going to have our code. So I've got a new folder with today's date. Uh, what day is it already? Today the 12th. So inside of that folder is where we're going to work with uh, Notepad. So go ahead and go to your Start menu, and you're going to launch the Notepad software. Um, if you've been doing this at home, remember you, you need to download it. Um, you have Notepad or you have other software to use. That's the one I recommend for this class. So Notepad. Once you get the notepad file, you're going to go to f uh, File Save As. <clears throat> so you'll get used to this procedure, but we'll do it together a few times. Into the folder, today's date, June 12th. So you'll save the file, today's date into a folder with today's date. Make sure it's .html. Even if you select save as type here, it may not do it properly, so remember to manually put the .html there. <laughs> I'm going to save that. As you recall, the default in Notepad uh, is that it's going to do autocomplete for us. We may or may not want that. Uh, I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to remind you how to turn that off in Notepad. If you go to the Settings menu, Preferences, under Preferences on the left side, we have uh, Auto Completion. You want to turn off enable autocomplete. You could leave it on if you want, but I would recommend as a as a beginner starting off in the code, I like to turn that off so that uh, you can uh, learn more from it. And then later on, it's a great time saver. I was just writing a lot of extensive code yesterday, way too late, uh, and uh, the auto completion is very useful. Eventually, once you kind of know the rhythm of it and how to write it and all of that, I like autocomplete. So you want to turn off Enable and click Close. And then we'll start off with a brand new blank document. Remember the first thing, uh, we have our tags, the angle brackets, less than, greater than. Inside of that, our very first tag that defines that this document is an HTML5 document. You don't write the number five, of course. It's just that that means HTML5. You have an HTML starting tag, HTML closing tag. So we can do a very, very basic skeleton um, in about 10 lines. We need the doc type, the HTML, head, body, what we'll do is once we set this up with our 10 basic 
uh, lines or so. We'll save this as a template so that we don't have to type this every time. We're going to start with a template that we can uh, base ourselves on, but we need a couple more lines. Back on the head. Um, remember we have the meta tag, which does not have a pair, but it has an attribute. So inside of the angle brackets, C-H-R-S-E-T, car set, we call it char set, car set, car set, however you want to say it. I say car set equals quote, end quote. <clears throat> and again, I like to complete the pairs of things because if I forget to close this pair, the rest of my app right here will be totally broken. If I did not close open quote, end quote, everything technically would be inside of this attribute and it would not be processed properly. So that's why I would recommend the pairs first and then the details. It's very easy to start writing the opening tag, write the stuff in between, and then forget to close the tag, especially if you're not using autocomplete. Our car set is UTF-8, basically to activate the various languages and alphabets, title, I'm keeping title on one line just because uh, it's going to be one simple word. I like to break tags into multiple lines when it's a lot of stuff in between and keep it on one line when it's one thing in between. This is going to be our, uh, this is also going to be our template in just a moment. So here I'll call this template. In the body, I will also write a heading one. Again, that's a one, not an L. If you write the L, it is not the right color. Blue, in my default color scheme, is a valid tag. That's still black, so it doesn't see it as a real tag. It sees it as a pair, but that's not enough to let you know that it's correct. That should be H1, number one. H1. And then now when when I don't have it selected, you'll see it's blue. So H1. And in between the H1, I'll write my template. We started to talk about comments previously. Uh, I want to write a little comment block here uh, to give myself credit that this is my work, that it's your work. Remind me, uh, this is a unique tag. What does the comment tag look like? Open tag. Uh, Exclamation marks and dashes. Yes, so before the end of our body, exclamation point, dash, dash. I'm going to break this up into multiple lines. So this is one of the weird ones. There's the opening and the closing. There's no slash, but it opens, it closes. In here will be a comment. Any valid code becomes deactivated. What I want to use this comment block for is to give myself, give yourself a little credit. So name. Project date description version This is completely optional, but it's useful because it's a little spot for you to put information for yourself or other people on the team and such. So here, of course, you'll write your name. The project is template. You can often take the project name from the title, although they don't have to be the same. And notice here, one thing I like a lot about Notepad is that when you select a word, 
it should also highlight the other instances of that word throughout your code. So when you've got hundreds of lines of code, you select, you know, the, the title tag, it'll show it everywhere else where it exists. I've selected the word template and it exists in other places. This is one way to help you debug and troubleshoot your code. I expected some code here, it didn't work, what's wrong with it? I often can select a, an example of the code and when it does not highlight er elsewhere, it often helps me figure out, oh, I typed it wrong. Now be careful though, because it'll highlight it even if it's uppercase and lowercase. And later on, we will see that uppercase and lowercase does matter. You have to type your code uppercase and lowercase properly when necessary. Today's date, description, our basic starting point. Version 1.0. I said previously one thing that I like to do that it depends on the way you were taught to program. Um, visually, I also like to write my code in a nice looking way. Not that, not that it works, as all of this code probably will work as soon as we run it. But visually, what I also want to do is this. I want to tab these lines over so that they line up like that. This is totally optional. HTML will not care. Actually, the web browser renderer will not care. Uh, but I like that. I like that it's nice and lined up. Aesthetically, this is optional. It's adding a few bytes here, yes. And I'm often talking about saving bytes elsewhere. But that looks nice. White space. It's white space. It's collapsed. It doesn't appear in the actual design. So that's the project so far. I'm going to save it. So I'm going to save what I have so far, but I also want to copy this as my starting point. Next time, I don't want to have to start over. I want to have a template. That's what we're designing here. We're going to use this to go to the next chapter, but I want to save this first as a copy. Go up to File menu save a copy as. I'm going to save this copy as template.html. That template, then I can open it next time and uh, get started quickly, those lines of code there. Save a copy as. The name here, template. So I did a regular save. This is the one we're going to work on in just a moment, chapter three. And then this is a template, which I can start to use next time, which you can then use next time. Now, perhaps a better thing, whoops, a better thing to do was we should have tested our code to see if that was, if it worked, and then save the template. So uh, remember to check the result, you run, and choose a web browser. I'm going to go with Run Firefox. Choose any one you want. Run Firefox. Check out that it works. You should see template up on the tab and my template in the body and nothing else. If all of that other text, your name and stuff appears, you didn't write your comment properly and you want to check with me that you wrote your code. That's, that should be the result. We should have checked that before you did save a copy. If it looks weird, call me over. We'll fix it, and then you want to save your template. Does that look good for everyone? Anyone need any help? All right, so that's our template that we're going to start off with. If you've got the book, I'm going to go with uh, page 64. This is about lists, so bullet points, numbered lists, other things. Uh, I sent out an email, you should not be surprised, but I sent out an email um, that you should have looked at the rest of chapter two yourself. 
we need it, you needed to look at things like abbreviation, site, address, insert, other ones. You should have finished the chapter. You should have looked at the chapter at least yourself, chapter two. And then uh, in chapter two, page 58 is an example that I recommend, that I said on the email, I recommend you, you, you do the example at the end of each chapter. It's not exactly homework, but I recommend you do it meaning write what is there and then see how you can change it or add to it from what you learned in the chapter. Those examples don't always have everything that you learned in the chapter. So I would recommend check the example. And we're going to start with chapter 3 ourselves. This one will be a pretty quick chapter. Okay, so ordered lists. We're going to make bullet points. We're working on our example project. Uh, template was uh, our starting point, but we're going to change this. So uh, we'll go back to title. Type uh, June, June 6th. Chapter 3. June 12th, yes, sixth month, June 12th, something like that. I'm going to give myself some space here, so I'm going to leave the comment, the comment here, I'm going to leave it as the last thing, so I'm going to make space in between in here, so uh, this is chapter three. Let's say uh, we're doing uh, recipes, so H2, recipes. Three cookies. This tab that I did for heading three is because visually I want to see that this content that's coming up is related to this section of recipes. Uh, I'm on chapter three and I'm doing some stuff here. So that tab again, that white space is just there for visuals. <coughs> Um, and then H4. Again, I'm not doing these simply one, two, three, four. I'm doing them with a purpose. Cookies will have a section of stuff. And cookies is a subsection of recipes. And recipes is part of my whole chapter three concept. So don't just write those in order number wise. Because we have here ingredients. And then another H4. Steps. What's another term for that? Steps or method. method. Let's try method. Method of preparation. Method. So we have ingredients of cookies and we have uh, method of preparation. Both of those are H4. They both relate to cookies. Let's back up actually chocolate chip cookies or whichever cookie you like. So what we're setting up here is we need to describe the ingredients of this cookie. And then we need to describe the steps, the method of preparation. One of them needs to be done in a specific order, and the other one does not. So we have bullet points for both of those tasks. Remember a lot about what HTML is, the right tag for the right task. Here's the secret. You don't need to have memorized all 200 codes of HTML or all 200 codes of, of uh, CSS or all 200 codes of JavaScript. You don't need to have every one of them memorized. And the other secret is that I don't. I just look them up. I look them up when I need to do something. Like last night, I was doing some complex coding on an app, uh, an inventory tracking app. And there were some things, OK, what I want to do is x, y, and z. Let me look up the code that will let me do that. I don't have it memorized, but I can look it up in one of my books or online and then figure out what the code is and then write it for my purposes. So bullet points are one of the common ones to do. And the way it works is that under ingredients, we start with a tag, ol, or we'll do ul 
first. We'll see that. Uh, I'll put that in a couple of lines because there's going to be bullet points in between. And basically, this is bullet points. It doesn't make any sense. What does the U mean and what does the L mean? I'll explain it in a moment. But this is bullet points. And each individual bullet point is then going to be a list item, an LI. So let's say eggs, another bullet point, another LI. Butter, another bullet point, LI. It's not LI1, LI2, LI3, or anything like that. It's LI, flower. Save it and run it. And we'll see that we have each individual item of a list. And then we have a list of bullet points. So we, we had to build these bullet points a couple of ways. If you run the result, You do have to close it, so I went back, uh, open, close, open, close, or else it gets weird. So again, I'm marking that this is an egg, and it's one of the bullet points, so LI around it. That's what it should look like. So bullet points, uh, eggs, butter, flour, there it is in the order that I wrote it. Each one is a list item as part of an unordered list. So maybe make a comment here for yourself. UL unordered list, AKA bullet points. LI list item. A bullet point. So there's no order to this. In this aspect of things, I don't need to get those ingredients in any order. But under method, I do need to do it in a certain order, as we'll see in a moment. Um, so before we do the method, check this out. Go back, if this worked, go back and change UL slash UL. Change them to OL, letter OL slash OL. So go back just to check this out. Change both of those UL tags to OL, not a, not a zero, an O. And in this class, I have to differentiate zeros and O's. We're very, we can't very commonly say, you know, 1901. But computer-wise, an O and a zero is very different. So I avoid using, you know, uh, you'll type uh, 1027. No, it's 1027, because it, the O and the zero are different. So that's an O. OL looks like this. Ordered list, which is the one we'll do under method in a moment. Ordered list. Now there's an order. First item, second item, third item. We don't need to write any special uh, extra markup to write the numbers. It knows the numbers. It's just going to go in order. Ordered list. This is the order. One, two, three. I add another list item. It'll automatically be four. And we have a way to control it starting in number seven and going up. We have a way to do that. We'll see that later. We have a way also to change it instead of numbers, regular old numbers. We can do Roman numerals. We can do ABC, capital ABC, lowercase abc. Maybe if you're writing a, an outline for a class project, you do you know, the Roman numerals and the A's and all of that, ABC. We can do that. But the default behavior of an ordered list is numbers. 
in the default behavior of a unordered list is round bullet points. I'm going to put that back to unordered. So the default of an unordered list is round little round bullet points. We can do square bullet points. We can make a little picture, like an icon of a little happy face or something. We can change the default behavior of most tags via CSS later. They all have a default, and we can reassign that default later. So we'll create an ordered list. We'll make up some steps in section of method. So we'll start first with ordered list, ol tag. This could be an example where possibly you could copy and paste, because I will want to make three items. You can write it manually. You can copy that chunk right there and paste it and change it to ols. It'll be a little time saver. In the beginning, I might do it the long way, but then eventually I'll do shortcuts. Here's a shortcut at least. If you write your first list item, why not copy that and paste it two more times on the next line so you can save yourself a little bit of that effort of uh, retyping it. That list items, bullet points, and then I'll fill them in. I copy and paste that. And again, with the mouse, we're very used to using the mouse uh, to navigate. I would recommend, as soon as possible, get used to using the keyboard. You will be able to navigate all over your code with the arrow keys. Right? Arrow keys to navigate all around. And you can even make selections with your arrow keys. You're used to clicking and dragging to make a selection. The problem with that is sometimes your hand is not steady. I'm trying to make a selection. Whoops, I also went too far down or too far up. So with the arrow keys, holding shift and arrow keys, you're making selections as well. Shift up and down, you're making selections. So you're going to see me do that a lot because it's going to be much more much faster and more accurate. Let's say I want to select that whole, well, let's say up here. I wanted to select this whole line, 13. I'd have to click and drag and select, and I accidentally drag up, drag down. Well, if I go to the beginning of the line, and remember, you can press Home to jump to the beginning of a line, and I hold Shift and press End, it went all the way to the end of the line and selected it. So I'm going to mention these keyboard shortcuts often because I hope they stick because if you're going to be serious about programming the mouse is actually going to slow you down getting used to the arrow keys the home key the end key shift home shift end all of that will help you select and navigate your code easier let's say uh, crack eggs beat into sugar uh, eat butter add to a sugar mixture or in bowl place in oven. Obviously there's lots of details. I don't know how to cook how to, I don't know how to bake real cookies, but uh, this is uh, a possibility. It sounds right. Save that and then run it. Now I have baked cookies, yes, but off the top of my head I don't remember how to bake the cookie. So that's what we've got so far. Ordered list, unordered list. Any questions on that? Is that working for everyone? Um. 
We have another kind of list, definition list. Its purpose is to show a bunch of definitions. Uh, this one's a little more complex. It takes basically three uh, tags. Notice here we combined ULs and LIs. Those, that combination creates a list, unordered. We have OL and LI. That combination creates a bullet, an ordered list. We then, on page uh, 67, have three tags that we need to use to create a definition list, like uh, in a dictionary. In our case, let's say, uh, we're going to back up over here and get complex. Let's say uh, eggs. We're going to have uh, like, uh, let's say, uh, s some complex kind of ingredient. We've got eggs, butter. Uh, Let's say, I don't know if this is even real, Tuscan butter. Let's say butter from Tuscany. It's really high end and makes your cookies really tasty. And what I want to do is I then want to uh, have kind of notes or definitions at the end of my recipe here. So let's say uh, another heading four, definitions. We're going to have here a definition list. We have DL, DT, and DD. DL is the actual definition list. We have OL, UL, DL, definition list. Then we're going to have DT, the definition term. What are we defining? Tuscan butter. And then DD, definition data. What is the data that we're defining? So first, DL. Definition list. DT. Definition term. I'm going to say we're going to define Tuscan butter. Here again, I'm doing a little copy and paste. Definition data. That one I will break into a couple of lines. Rich creamy butter from the mountains of Tuscany. fancy flower and then define it try that then I'll do it in a moment so try a new definition with its DT and DD So save it and run it, and you'll see that your definition 
list looks something like that. Uh, automatically indented. That's just a, sort of a byproduct of the tag. We don't use this set up to indent things. We use CSS to control indenting and all of that. But the default of a DL, definition list, is that the definition text is on that indenta indentation level, and that the DD is indented. Via CSS later, we can control it to make the definition text italicized, bigger size, all of that. Because we do have the knowledge, if you recall, we can make this uh, italicized, but a better way we'll, we'll see a little later. Um, because if we add emphasis, if we add emphasis to a DT, it does become italicized. But I would need to add emphasis to each one of these, and that's I've got 12 definitions. I have to add em to 12 of them. No, via CSS, later on, we'll see that we can apply one code, and it'll automatically sort of trickle down or attach itself to the right place. This manually here is a waste of time. Later, with CSS, we will redefine the DT. We will say that the DT will automatically, wherever it appears, will be italicized. This is what CSS is about, to quickly style a project. So don't bother putting italics here like I did. I'm just showing you here it only applied to one. Later with CSS, we will make all DTs italicized, or red, or bold, or bigger text, or drop shadows via CSS. Page 60 mentions that you can have lists inside of lists. You can have bullet points inside of bullet points. You can have a bullet point list, and then inside of it, item 2 is numbered list. That can get kind of complex, but you can check page 68 on your own, and if you ever need to do that, you just, put, you just create an, a list inside of a list, the OL or the UL inside of a UL or OL, and you have a nested list. Page 70 then ends the chapter. It's an example of using lists. And look at that. They copied us. They also made a recipe page. That's the end of chapter 3. Any questions on chapter 3? We're going to see that some of these chapters, we go through them pretty quick. And then uh, some of them take a little longer. And then we'll have homework assignments eventually. We're going to go through a few lessons. And then we'll have a homework where we build up some of the things we learned uh, for a project. We're not quite there yet. So, chapter 4, links. This is the HT part of HTML, hypertext. So, page 75, links are the defining feature of the web because they allow you to move from one web page or another, enabling the very idea of browsing or surfing. So again, in 1989, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, student at a university, figured out, what if I invent a code that will let us jump from one document to another? And again, nowadays, obvious, going from here to here, clicking on this to watch another cat video. But in the old days, there was no easy way to go from one cat video to another cat video. There were no cat videos. Uh, so Tim, Sir Tim, uh, invented HTML. And one of the big ideas was, OK, we've got this document full of scientific formulas. And I want to jump from the table of contents at the top. I want to jump down to the actual item. Or I have this document that's all about cooking. And I want to click a link to jump to another document about uh, technology. So links. HTML, a markup language for links, hypertext. That's the fancy word for that, links, hypertext. So we have various examples here of how to link 
number one, first of all, number page 77, tells us that we're going to use the linking tag, and then we have to add an attribute to further define the tag. So we have the tag and the attribute. Let's say I want to link Tuscany. I want to make the word Tuscany link to an article all about Tuscany. So in my case, line 28, I've got that line where I wrote Tuscany. I'm going to use the A tag, A for anchor. There is a tag called link, but we use it for something totally different later on. A for anchor. So that's going to create a link, but it doesn't know where to take us. We then therefore need to add an attribute. So inside of the first A tag, beginners confuse this. You want attributes only on the beginning tag, not the ending tag. And we've written one tag so far with an attribute. Anyone know which one? We have a tag with an attribute, at least one so far. Meta, car set, language. Yeah, right there. Meta tag has an attribute, car set, UTF-8. Notice the syntax. Some name of an attribute, car set. Some value of that attribute, in this case UTF-8. We see that over and over and over. That's the syntax of an attribute. So for the A tag, we just need to know the attribute and then set the uh, value. The attribute is href, hypertext reference, equals quote, end quote. Looks exactly the same syntax as my meta tag. Attribute value, I mean attribute name, attribute value, attribute of a tag. And here we can type a website. Wikipedia.org. You can think of A also as active link. It's anchor, technically, but A for active link. I'm creating an active link here. Type the whole address, the whole HTTP part of it, because we can have internal and external links. We'll talk about that later. This is an external link. Go ahead and save it and run it. You should see then your project has the word Tuscany, like an active link, which is the default blue and underlined, which we can change later. Yes. So internal link means that it's going to open it in this page instead of making a new tab? No, that's um, related to that, but that's not quite that is. An internal link is a link that is within my own website, basically. An external link is a link that goes off to someone else's website. Opening new tabs and all of that, we will do that in a moment, but it's related to external links. So if we click, if you click the Tuscany link, it goes off to the Wikipedia homepage. It would be nice if we actually go directly to the page of Tuscany. So why not look up on Wikipedia Tuscany, and we will get an actual page, Tuscany, region of Italy. This is the actual link I want. Tuscany, capital T. That's the link I want, not just the, the link to the home page of Wikipedia. I want the actual deep link in the Wikipedia site. So get that link, copy it, right click copy, and instead of that, basically paste it in. see that it should go directly to 
Tuscany now. The problem is when you see many links, uh, usually they uh, open in their own window or tab, because let's say a person is on my site, they click on Tuscany, they look at Wikipedia, and then half an hour later, they've been on Wikipedia, like it often happens. Well, then they close, you know, they close the window, I'm done with that article, they close the window, and whoops, they lost my whole site. Usually doesn't what happen, you click a link and it opens in a new window or a new tab. You look at that stuff, you close that tab, you're still on the original page. So we have another attribute that we can add here to make this open in its own page, its own window. These are listed on, this is mentioned on page 86, opening links in a new window. We need to add another attribute. We have an attribute of href. We'll add a new attribute. Be careful here. You want to add a new space after the quote of the previous attribute. Sometimes beginners keep writing a new attribute inside the quote, which, which will be wrong because this attribute name needs an attribute value, and now you need a new attribute pair, which is target. Yes, there is a target attribute, but no, there's not a Walmart attribute. And the specific target here is blank, underscore blank. That's the underscore symbol right there. Basically, we're saying, now open our document in a blank new tab. The target of this reference is a blank window. This is a link, an active link wrapped around a word. We have other targets. This is the most common one. And in the old days, web browsers, by default, you click the link and it would open a new window. And then now most browsers open a new tab by default. So we have the ability to open a window, but now it's not the default anymore. Nowadays, it's going to open a new tab. So you see here, well, I've got a bunch of tabs from my work. But if I click on Tuscany, a new tab opened up to make a new window. Nowadays, that's basically JavaScript. The default used to be a new window, but everyone hated those because all of these pop-ups were appearing and spam and all of that. So now the web browsers have decided the standard is a new tab. And you have to write extra code to make windows again. <coughs> I'm going to make a note on the next line, just because it's going off the edge of my page. A for links requires href attribute, the URL. The active link, the a tag creates links, requires href. Actually, I'm going to break this into multiple lines because I have a couple of things to say there. Uh, external links, internal links, links to a site or page outside your own. URL. So right now we're working with a website that's on your desktop, but eventually you will be able to upload your work to a real web server. I have those accounts and I'm going to give them to you soon. You'll be able to upload your code to a real web server so that then you can access your code, view your code from anywhere in the world, putting it on a real web server once, once we get more experience. So external would be that we're linking to some other site or page or server or file or whatever on someone else's 
site an internal links within your own URL. So let's say I have victor.com slash recipes.html. <coughs> if I link then to some other, like Food Network, well, my website linking to another website, external. Let's say I've got victor.com slash recipes.html and victor.com slash technology.html, two pages on my same site, victor.com. And if I link between them, those are more of external links on my own site. External often uses target blank. No need for target blank, usually. Beginners, I, I often see do this as well. Once we create more pages, home page, contact page, buy page, or product page, I sometimes see beginners on their own site, they're doing target blank to their own links. So from home page, target blank to about page. And now you've got two screens. And then from the home from the about page, they click on to products page with a target blank, and now they've got three windows of their own site. And someone that's browsing your site has all of these tabs opened up on your own site. And then when they go to close, there's your site still there, still there, still there. Because you don't need a target blank on your own links, your own internal links. On your own, you should look at page 81 and 82. Let's see, 81 through 84. We, we're not going to do it just yet because we don't have enough files to work with. We've only got today's file. But pages 81 and 82, for example, talk about the relationship between files, a parent file, a child file, grandparent files, all of that. So you want to look at page 82. It's got a nice chart about that. And once we create more pages or more screens, it'll make more sense. Then 83 talks about relative and absolute addresses. Again, we don't really have a lot of files to link together. So I won't cover it just yet, but we'll come back to those pages. 85, make a note to skip page 85. Page 85, you don't need to know this really. You don't need to, you don't want to do this. You can know about it, but you don't want to do this. On page 85, here's a way to make a link so that when someone clicks something, it can send an email. Well, that sounds great, but actually, no, not, not nowadays. The code that's on page 85 is not useful anymore because this is how you're going to get spammers harassing you. Because if if you see page 85, it says you can uh, create the href and use mail to, M A I L T O, and that'll send an email to someone. The problem there is that's going to require for you to put your email address into the code of your site. And what spammers do is they run their spam bots 24 hours a day trying to find websites and trying to find email addresses. So if you put your email address naked on your web page like that, it's going to get harvested and you're going to start to get spam. So every email has the pattern of something at something dot something. Every email has that pattern. Look at your email, look at all the emails you've ever looked at. Some of them are like, you know, j.smith at qualcomm dot biz. Yeah, but they're all that pattern. So spam bots are looking for that pattern, stealing that email address, and sending you spam. So the short answer, what I'm trying to get at, is don't use the code on page 85. Later, we can learn about creating a more, a better contact method, such as a contact form, which keeps your address safer, your email address safer. Can you tweak it um, so that it's not necessarily exactly that format? You could, but it'll it'll break it. 
uh, you know, the, once a person clicks on that link, it's going to try to send an email address to that address that you wrote. And if you tweak it, yeah, you put the, the word at instead of the symbol at. So the spammers have figured that out. And if you write the word dot, D-O-T, instead of the dot, spammers have figured that out. So it's just better to not have your email address and instead use a form. Yes? How does Craigslist do it? Because I know that on Craigslist website, if you click um, contact and then you hit on the email, then it takes you directly to the email to send it. Does it open, I haven't used it very recently, but does it open an email, like an email on their page? Or does it open like an Outlook? Or how does it open? Yeah, so they, they must be doing then the old mail to method, which is not recommended. So uh, I, I don't really use Craigslist much, and I, I don't know, it, it might be they're not quite doing it the safest way. So you might start to get spam from that. Um, a contact form is often better. here okay um, we can do this one page 87 and 88 linking to a specific part of the same page we have a link in our document here that is an external link that goes off to some other website and this is chapter three, recipes. We've got one recipe, recipe chocolate chip cookies. Let's say next we have another recipe. We're not gonna rewrite a whole recipe here. But what we'll do is, um, I'm gonna copy and paste. We will copy and paste some of this structure and change it a little bit so that we have a second recipe so that then we can set up a way to jump from one part of the document to another. I wanna keep the definitions section at the end but this structure here in my case from line 11 to 23 this is a chunk of information which is set up with a heading of what recipe it is what the ingredients are what the method is and then details let's copy this chunk not the definition copy the chunk, not the recipe's header. Copy that chunk that defines what a chocolate chip cookie is. Copy it. Give yourself a new line after that recipe, but before the definitions, and paste it. So from about lines 11 to 23, and if your lines don't match up as mine, that's okay. You see what I'm getting at. Copy from the heading 3 down to the ordered list ending. Paste. So I've got two copies of that chocolate chip recipe. I want that so that I can change the details. Right here, take a moment to make up whatever you want here. Make up another thing. Uh, peanut, butter, peanut butter cookies. Um, or snickerdoodles or whatever. Just fill in those details and then we'll see what to do with it. Question? Did you just uh, paste it? back into the same uh, same document but right after itself so see how there's the first part of it where I copied and then I pasted the same thing right after itself okay. this is a big time saver copy and paste I want to create another recipe here I need ingredients I need method I need a title that's that so copy and paste you make up anything you want there for another recipe. It technically doesn't have to be a cookie recipe. We're simply in the section of recipes. Let's say here next snickerdoodle ingredients eggs plain old butter plain old flour maybe I'll add a fourth item Turbinado sugar. Preparation. You can just make that up however you want. Add sugar and flour. 
together. Just uh, change it a little bit, different recipe. We're setting ourselves up so that we have different parts of the document we can jump to. We'll have sort of like a little table of contents at the beginning, and then a way to link from the table of contents at the top to pages down below. It's page 87 and 88. At the top of a long page, you may want to add a list of contents that links to the corresponding sections lower down. Or you may want to add a link from part way down the page back to the top to save users from having to scroll back to the top. Before you can link to a specific part of the page, you need to identify the points in the page that links will go to. You do this using an ID attribute which can be used on every HTML element. We're going to create a new element, or a new attribute that is, an ID uh, to identify where we can jump to. So this is going to be done in two parts. We need an ID about where we jump to. And then we need a tag of a tag, active link, to actually move us from that point down to another point. So to the heading three of Snickerdoodle and to the heading three of Chocolate Chip Cookies, we're going to add an attribute, ID. We will see IDs are very useful when we also get to CSS. An ID is a way to identify an element so that we can do more with it. Whatever this ID is, we can make it up. This is one of the cases where we are going to make it up. Um, so we'll call this R-E-C-S-N-I. This, this can be any word you want. Right, R-E-C recipe, snickerdoodle. I have a capital S here for readability. But capital letters do matter. Uh, we could use dashes or underscores and such. Just follow along for the moment. This is a recipe for this type of cookie, whatever yours was. If you did, you know, peanut butter cookie, R E C P E N. You know, or you could call it recipe peanut butter, whatever. You can call this ID, that attribute, value, anything you want. but. If you give it a big, long name, you're going to need to type that name properly every time you need it. So shorter names might be better. Back up to the chocolate chip cookie. And add an ID there as well. And this will also be REC, recipe, CHO, chocolate. So I'm identifying the places where we will be able to jump to via a link. I'm also going to add a comment ID attribute identify ID attribute to link to that part of the page, of the document. With the two parts, where are we linking to, and then how are we linking to it? We're going to back up to the top of the document somewhere and create a very simple table of contents. Then we're going to link those items. The table of contents will list the, the cookie recipes we have, the names of the, each of the cookies. Then we're going to click the link in the table of contents, and it'll jump us down to the identified part of the, uh, the page.
we'll do one more. Uh, we'll give an ID to definitions. Defs. Definitions. Now I had a capital letter on the other one because it's very common that when you have uh, more than one word to make the second or third word capitalized. So if I had called this my definitions, my defs, that's valid where it's all lowercase. My defs, capital D, that's valid. My dash defs, that's valid. Any of these are valid pretty much, except that you want to remember what how you wrote it. Defs, that's fine. Capital defs, that's fine. But that's not that common. It's pretty common to have the second or third word in a grouped word capitalized, but not the first one. You see that a lot when you see people's code. Defs. We'll back up to the top. Chapter three recipes. Let's see, we'll put our table of contents right after recipes. Create a paragraph here. I'll keep it on one line. Chocolate chip space pipe character. Have you ever seen this character, this vertical line? You can do it by using shift backslash, not slash. Slash is that forward slash, backslash is that backward slash slash is shift question mark and backslash is shift pipe backslash is right above your enter key right below backspace is backslash shift backslash vertical character pipe the pipe character later on we can make some more interesting looking symbols Click on those to jump down to where I've identified each part. Before I do that, you can take a quick look in the browser to see if it looks right. Should be something like that. Chocolate chip won't be that impressive because we're already there at the top. But once we click on these ones that are lower in the page, the, the screen will move down focus on those sections. These require A tags, active links, but written in a little bit of a different way. And these will be internal links. So wrap the A tag around this first one here. We have P for paragraph. That's the whole element, all of the table of contents. Then on each individual clickable item, we have the A tag, which needs the attribute href. And then we need to say the name of the attribute here in this special way, with the hash mark and then the name of the, attri of the ID to have this hash mark. This is basically, the hash mark is basically shorthand for ID equals this. It will be very important when we get to CSS and JavaScript. Uh, but this is how we use it here. We're linking to something, the ID rectchaco. So we need hashtag the hash mark. No hash mark here. The hash mark basically means ID. ID hash mark that you're wrong. Do, this, do the same thing for snickerdoodle. Wrap an A tag around snickerdoodle, add an href pound or hash mark pound sign 
rec sni. And then for the last one, href equals pound def. Snickerdoodle a tag. Each one needs an opening and closing a tag, of course. Needs the href. Pound. Pound symbol. Rec sni. Whatever you called it. And remember this. If you select a word, it should highlight elsewhere. That's one way to make sure I typed it right. I highlighted it here, it also highlighted down there. And then, then the definition. If you save and run that, click on definitions first, just to show that it'll jump you down. Oops, I call it defs. Didn't go anywhere. Oh, it's defs. Okay, if you click on definitions, it jumps you down, it shows definitions. Go back to the top, click Snickerdoodle, jumps you down to Snickerdoodle. Now, depending on your screen, if you've got it maximized, it may not be that impressive. But if you've got your screen a little bit smaller, something like this, I'm going to make my web browser smaller like this. Now, if I click Definitions, it scrolls down. Snickerdoodle scrolls down. Chocolate chip doesn't go that far. But it does move, move there. Question. So is that how you would do like a back to top kind of thing? Yeah, we're gonna do that right now. Also, I would like to go back to the top, so we'll need both of those elements, some sort of link at the bottom. This is back to top, and then I'm gonna need to put an ID somewhere at the top to take us back to the top. Question. So here, then, uh, let's do a back to top. Uh, we first set it up that we made an ID and then an href. You don't have to do them in any special order. I'm going to do it backwards this time. I'm going to make the link first, and then I'll add the ID. So either way will work. So the link is, let's go all the way to the bottom of our document. Uh, let's say right after the definitions. So after that, DL, uh, new paragraph. So paragraphs also, we use them even if it's going to be one word. That is because then we define an element that is separate from another element. Paragraphs are separate from other elements. New paragraph, which I'll say back to top. So 
that's at the end of my document before the, the comment at the end. A tag, I'll wrap a tag around all of that, or maybe just one word or a second word or whatever. A tag needs an href. <coughs> Thank you. So href, we're going to link to some place that doesn't exist yet. It's not going to be wrong, it's just it's incomplete. Previously, we, we added an ID to the element, and then a link. Now, this time I'm doing a link, and then we'll add the ID to the element. I'm going to create an element called pound top. Hashtag, hash mark, top. So I need to add an ID somewhere of top. This will link us to somewhere called top. Remember to put the hash mark on this href. If you don't put that, it'll think you're trying to go to a completely different page. The hash mark keeps it on the current page. Without it, it thinks you want to go to another page. So we need to add id equals top somewhere, probably at the very top, some, one of the first elements at the top. Um, h1. It's the first visible element the body. You wouldn't, you wouldn't really add it up to any of these, meta or title. These are not part of the, the main body. We're not actually linking to those to scroll there. That doesn't really work. The first element in this case is a heading 1. So heading 1 needs an ID of top, not with the pound symbol. Pound symbol basically means ID. ID equals the name of the ID, no pound. Pound is when you link to it, href. The pound symbol is a shortcut for ID equals, basically. You save now and run that. Click definitions to jump all the way down. You will see then a back to top. Click back to top, and it should jump you all the way to the top. See that, so I'll run it. Again, you get the best effect uh, if your browser is smaller than full screen. I'm going to click definitions, jumps all the way down to definitions. I see back to top, click back to top, goes back to top. Now, on some of these, if you click Snickerdoodle, for example, it does put it at the top of the browser. Definition, it doesn't because there's no more below the document to show. Now, there's at the top of the, of the browser. This is not going to appear right at the top because there's nothing below it. It's, it doesn't exist. So it puts it up as high as it can, whereas Snickerdoodle and uh, Chocolate Chip does move it to the top of the document because there's more below it. Snickerdoodle the same. There's only one back to top. You could have back to top at the end of each of these recipes. You can reuse the same href and the same ID. So if you want to complete this, I want to back to top at the end of each of these recipes. You can copy the whole back to top code. We still need something that says back to top. It needs to be linked to that ID. We can copy and reuse that. That ID that we have on H1, we're, we're just reusing it. Copy that back to top. And I'm going to paste it right at the end of the methods of the Snickerdoodle, 
and then also at the end of the methods of the chocolate chip cookie. Now each of those cookies at the end, imagine there's even more stuff, like a picture, which we'll do in a moment. Imagine there's even more stuff, so now the page is longer and longer. It would be nice that we have this back to top at every end of each article, or each recipe, to get back to the top where the table of contents is. So if I jump down to definitions, back to top, great. Jump down to snickerdoodle, it's got its own back to top, goes back, chocolate chip, back to top. They should all go back to the top. The one ID at the top is being linked to by three different hrefs. That works perfectly fine. So that's how that should work. Let's pause there. Does that look OK? Then we'll look at images. Images are pretty cool. Is this working for everyone? That ends uh, chapter uh, four. Again, you should be looking at the pages yourself to fill in some of these details. I, I give us the most important aspects of each chapter. I would recommend you do page 90, create that page for practice. You don't need to turn it in or anything, but look at page 90 and see how you can change it to practice. Page 96 starts our images chapter. We'll, we'll start to look at images ourselves, and that's actually a relatively simple concept. There's a lot in the chapter, but using images is pretty straightforward. We need a tag to display an image, number one. And number two, we need an image. So we'll do that. Page 97 and 98 talk about websites where you can go get images. Because the thing is that if you, if you simply do a Google search, or you search Yahoo or Bing or whatever, and you find an image and you download it to use, you're probably violating a copyright. Uh, that image is actually owned by someone. Now, nowadays, obviously a physical thing like my phone here, you you probably believe that it has a value of, I don't know, $500 or whatever, $200, $700. You believe that this thing has a value. You know, you pay for it or you have a contract or whatever. It has a value because it's a physical thing. A lot of people don't believe a picture has a value, a song has a value, a font has a value. They're copyrighted. They are things that were created, just like this phone was created. Right now, this website that you're creating, you have the copyright for it even though you didn't write anywhere copyright John you created something it's your right to copy it to make money from it that's the basic law of copyrights I have the right to copy it to make money off of it so images most likely someone created that image for a client for their website for their product for their gallery or something and therefore they have the copyright, the right to copy it to make money, and you don't. That's just the way it is. It's so easy for us to go searching online and find a million images that are perfect for our purposes, and then download it and use it, but so that you don't get into trouble, you don't want to go off and find images just with a regular search to use. The book mentions several websites that are safer for you to use to find the right image. iStock Photo, Getty Images, Veer, SXC, Photolia. Those are websites that are designed for images for you to use. Because possible negative results of simply borrowing someone's image is you can get an email that says, hey, take your photo, take my photo off your site, please. Uh, a ne next level up is, hey, you're using my photo, you owe me $20. Next level up of that is, hey, you're using my photo, here's my lawyer, I'll see you in court. That, of course, is the extreme scenario, but it happens. I've had people tell me in various classes uh, that they get caught with that image, and then there's consequences. How do they know? 
Well, they know there's metadata in the image, the file name, the data embedded into the image. You can search all of that and find it. People that really, really care about their images care that their images are not stolen. And that's a harsh word, but that's the right word. You're stealing someone's image if you simply find it on a website and download it. You don't know where it came from. You don't know who created it. So the book mentions a few websites, and I'm going to mention another one I really like. So we're going to grab an image that is OK for us to use, and then use it in our website. Go to pixabay.com, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y.com. The main thing about this site is free, high-quality images. People say, well, I heard that if you just give someone credit, that's OK. Maybe. It depends on who owns the original image. Some people might take the credit just fine, that's it. Other people might require the credit and compensation. So it's better to use images that you know are OK for you to use. Stock images, free images, even if you do a Google search for free cupcake picture. I don't trust that because it may, in the, in the free stuff, might have also mixed in one that was not free. And then you use that one and you could get in trouble. You could, and that's a different kind of a, a, a topic, because most of the time, if someone puts in something on YouTube, they want it to be shared and linked to. But doing a Google search is just Google throwing out a net all over the internet. I found this image, I found this image, without regard to copyrights. So YouTube is a sort of a different matter, but usually it's OK on YouTube. For images and such, it's trickier. So it's better to go to websites where we know it's OK. People sometimes say, OK, I heard that if you change the image 10%, you'll be safe. Well, it's up to the courts to decide what 10% is. How, would it, how do I change this 10%? I can rotate it. I can shrink it. I can remove a cookie if I have Photoshop skills. Well, by that time, you're already creating a new image. Why not shoot your own image? That's always the safest way to be. Create your own image, take out your phone, and take a photo of the item. And I can't take a, a picture of the Eiffel Tower at the moment, but I go to a website like Pixabay and find a picture of the Eiffel Tower that I can use on my websites legally and safely. Let's search here. Chocolate chip cookies. The first result is usually uh, sponsored images. Skip those. You usually have to pay for those. After that, OK, 73 images. I get 73 million results on Google. 73 million possibilities for you to make a mistake. So there's going to be less images on these kinds of sites, but you're going to find the right image uh, here. And if you don't find the right image, you should create your own image. So I found a picture of chocolate chip cookies. Click on it, anyone you like, click on it. On the right side, it says free download. Click on that. We have different sizes. We'll just go for the smallest size. We'll talk about details of sizes and file formats next time when we continue our image lecture. We'll just add one image, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, select the first image size. And click download. In Firefox, it's asking me, would you like to open it or save it? If you're in Chrome, it may have just downloaded by itself. You want to click Save. And the way image works, image work, you need to, on the easiest way, is make sure that that image that was downloaded is in the same folder as the project of your website. In my case, it downloaded, I think, to the desktop. I need to move that file into the folder project that we're working with. There's more complex ways to link, but this is the easiest way for the moment. The picture downloaded, but I need to place it in the same folder as my project. I can link to images online. We'll get to that next time. 
but I downloaded an image I moved it into the folder of the project and then I'll write some simple code to display this image in my project so you either need a picture in the same folder as your project or a complete address to a link we'll see that next time to finish placing this image in the document, let's see, we've got chocolate chip cookies, ingredients, method, before back to top, we'll add the image tag IMG. This is one of these tags that does not have a pair, but it has an attribute. The attribute of source, SRC. And in that source attribute, you need to type the name of your picture exactly as the file name. And I just saw that the file name is this huge, weird name. So that name right there is what you need to type into the source. You can Exactly. You, to save yourself effort, you can rename the original image, and then you type its name right there. I'm going to keep the name as is, but I'm going to copy that name and paste it here so that I don't misspell it. And the way you can copy the name is if you click on it one time, like you're going to rename it, then you can copy. You can type it manually and mistype it, or you can copy its file name or change its file name and type it there. So if we get the dot. JPG part, the full file name. So image tag is very basic, IMG. It has an attribute of source to display which image. There's my image in the same folder as my current HTML file. And I put the source as that file. I copied and pasted it. Don't forget the JPEG part. Save it and run it. You should have an image. When we come back next time, we're going to get more complex with images, like images online, changing the size of the image. Later, we'll talk about drop shadows and other cool stuff about images. If your image didn't quite work, I'll help you in just a moment. We're getting at, we're, we're kind of out of time at the moment. But this is what uh, we've got so far. Uh, HTML document with a bunch of bullet points and lists and links and images. We're starting to build a real website. Remember, I'm going to put this code. I'm about to put this code into the network folder if you want a copy of it. I'll also put it up online if you want it on Blackboard. We'll do a little bit of lab time uh, until 11 if you want. If not, see you again tomorrow, 9 o'clock.